This is increase access, decrease costs, transitioning your courses to low or no cost materials. And we'll start with some introductions. Um, I'm Larissa Garcia. I'm the information literacy librarian. And I'm also the subject specialist librarian for the School of Art and Design, the School of Family and Consumer Sciences, and the Nutrition and Dietetics program in the, sco in the School of Health Studies. And I'll let Deanna introduce herself. Hi, I'm Deanna Ferris. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the University Libraries, and I'm the subject specialist for psychology, leadership, educational psychology, and foundations, um, women and gender studies. Um, I'm going to be the um, subject specialist for history starting in spring, um, and I'm the curator of juvenile literature. Thanks, Deanna. So um, Deanna and I, and actually Tracy as well, we're all members of the Course Materials Task Force on campus, which began as a collaboration between CITL and university libraries, but now includes staff and faculty from across campus. And one of our main objectives is to engage with faculty and support them um, in using low or no cost materials. And one of the ways that we are trying to do that is to provide information and workshops and training, um, which is what we're doing here today. So these are our session outcomes for today. So we hope that by the end of the session, you'll be able to describe the impact of no or low cost course materials on student success. Um, we are going to give you a little bit of time to explore some resources for finding relevant disciplinary no or low cost materials. And we'd also like to give you some time to think about um, what your next steps might be for including no or low cost materials in your courses. So you may be kind of wondering why we're, we're talking so much about affordability. Um, and you've probably heard a lot about textbook affordability um, in the news more generally, but it actually has some really serious repercussions for here at home at NIU. Um, so as the infographic shows, um, the vast majority of NIU undergraduates um, receive financial aid. Um, and that's true actually of graduate students as well. And so most also work at least part time, many work full time um, just to make ends meet. And so the average cost of textbooks um, at um, across the country is about twelve hundred dollars at NIU. It's actually fourteen hundred dollars a year. And um, if you think about how many students are on financial aid, for most um, students who are on financial aid, that does not even cover the full cost of tuition, let alone room and board or textbooks. Um, so it, it's a kind of real struggle um, when they're trying to make decisions about what they're going to spend their money on. And so based on the current minimum wage, um, a student would have to, to work 127 hours just to cover the cost of books. And so um, with, with all things kind of being equal, um, you know, obviously they would they would spend that money. But um, you know, they're often in a kind of position where they have to make decisions about whether they're going to buy their textbooks or eat. And we actually have seen a lot of food insecurity at NIU even before the, the pandemic, and this has sort of been exacerbated. Um, so the, the issue of textbook affordability um, is a serious issue because it means that students may not be prepared for classes because they need to make um, choices about where their money is going to go. Um, the good news is that faculty members at NIU um, and at a campus across the country have been trying to find ways to ensure that students can afford their required course materials. Um, so it's probably pretty likely um, that you're actually already using um, some free materials in your courses. And so I just wanted to kind of you know, put out a question. Um, is there a one free resource that you're using in your classes that you'd like to share? Um, and, you know, this can be a YouTube video. Um, it can be um, an article uh, that you got through a library database, but um, any sort of um, free resource that, that you are using in your classes. Um, if you could try to put that in the chat and tell us what you're using and where you found it. Great, yeah, books available online through the library. 
we always like it when the library gets a plug. Okay, so in the biological sciences courses that you teach, uh, there's a lot of journal articles. Yes. And so you're getting that sort of that literature from the field, from that discipline through the databases. Yes. Um, library tutorials uh, uploaded to YouTube. Great. Um, yes, there's lots of different kinds of, of materials out there. Um, you know, so open textbook, um, teaching the digital age, follow the author on Twitter. Nice. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, open resources. Absolutely. Any others you want to share? Okay, so we're, we're seeing a kind of range of, of, uh, of kind of low or no cost materials. And there's lots of different stuff that's out there. Um, so, you know, maybe it's, a, you know, an image of a Frida Kahlo painting. Um, maybe it's um, a digital audio clip from a bowling alley we have one if you're interested um you know maybe it is kind of video tutorials maybe it's a dollar 99 streaming rental of jaws um or an old edition of hamlet there are all these different sorts of materials that are out there that can be used um free or nearly for free and many of them are incredibly easy to find i mean many of you have probably googled to find some of these materials um and they're also often free to use in an educational setting Um, and as already has been kind of commented on, um, the library can be an incredibly useful resource. Um, so many of you are probably have been using um, ebooks, um, especially ebooks if they have um, unlimited user licenses. Um, you might use um, print books that are part of our collection that you've put on course reserves. Um, you know, maybe you found an article through one of our databases and have kind of linked to the PDF of, the, of that article um, or kind of worked with course reserves to have it put in your Blackboard shell. Um, there are all of these possibilities. Um, it's possible too that you, you've heard about um, the textbook purchase program and the textbook purchase recommendation form, um, where if you wanted the library to purchase um, a copy of required materials for your course, that we would put them either on um, print reserve at the library, or if it's a sort of electronic resource, then, then we kind of give you that link so that you can link um, provide that link to your students. Um, we tend to do this for both the fall and the spring semester. Um, pretty soon you'll start to see um, emails um, or kind of um, notices kind of coming out across campus um, that we're looking for um, anyone who wants to sort of submit a, a textbook purchase recommendation form for the coming semester, we would love to see that. And Larissa has put the um, link in the chat. Um, we don't purchase um, all materials. Um, we have some, some rules about what we will and will not purchase, uh, but you can always kind of find out by looking, um, it, looking at that site to, to see what we can get. Um, so, so those are some of the things that the library can do, uh, but there are also other kinds of, of resources. And so, as we said, there are a lot of materials out there that are, that are free or low cost. Um, so, as as Loressa mentioned earlier, um, you know, we make a lot of um, tutorials ourselves, but we also sometimes link to a YouTube video that another library has made that's, you know, really on point. Um, and so, um, we have um, all of these things that we've kind of been talking about already. Um, but it's kind of important to remember the difference between something that is free or kind of free to use and something that is open. So not all free sources are open, but all open educational resources are free. And when we're talking about open educational resources, we're referring to resources, tools, and practices that are free of legal, financial, and technical barriers and can be fully used, shared, and adapted in the digital environment. And so what makes a resource open is the license the creator of the copyright holder gives you to use it, share it, or transform it so that it meets your particular needs. And so it becomes a kind of um, bespoke resource that, that really is what you want and need it to be. I think you're muted, Larissa. Thank you. 
Uh, COVID-19 definitely showed us the importance of students having access to course materials remotely. And while several companies provided access um, or free trials to their collections for in the early months of the pandemic, it was definitely temporary and it really highlighted issues of access and how dependent we really are on publishing companies when it comes to educational content. Um, there's actually been some important uh, legislative activity this year regarding zero textbook costs or ZTC initiatives. For example, in Illinois, um, we recently passed the College Course Materials Affordability and Equitable Access Collaborative Study Act, which is a mouthful. Um, but the act is to create a task force that will study the cost saving methods and practices of both public and private higher ed institutions in the state. Whoops. Um, in addition, there are already some states like California, Oregon, Washington, and Texas that have passed legislation requiring educational institutions to label courses that use no cost materials in their schedules and registration systems. And Illinois actually has some examples of this as well. The College of Lake County and McHenry County College, um, they both mark their um, class schedule with courses that are low or no cost um, textbook courses. So $25 or less or $50 or less respectively. And this is actually something that our task force is working on as well. The new registrar is a member of our task force. And so we're working on um, developing a labeling system in my NIU uh, for no or low cost um, course materials. These are some of the benefits of using low or no cost course materials. And um, obviously at the very top of the list, the most important thing is that it expands access to learning. Um, in addition to what Deanna shared about our students at NIU, a recent national study showed that two thirds of students surveyed um, did not purchase their assigned uh, course materials because of cost. And as was already mentioned, that really does impact um, academic success. In addition, no or low cost course materials um, are, uh, are a good way to supplement um, the curriculum where there might be gaps that exist. Uh, they are often easier to distribute widely and quickly, so um, they often in include um, much more current information. And low or no cost course materials are also often easier to edit, adapt, or update, so they are continually being improved upon. So those are some of the benefits, but we'd actually like to hear what you think are some of the barriers or challenges um, to using low or no cost course materials. So if you'd like to share um, some challenges or things that you think make it difficult to transition to low or no cost course materials, we'd love to hear, your, um, you can either unmute yourself or you can drop it in the chat. Copyright issues, right? Licensing, that's a good one, definitely. So struggling to find material for upper level and more specific courses. Yes, um, definitely finding the appropriate material or relevant material is, is, can be challenging. Right, thanks Tracy. Making sure it's quality. Quality is something that we're all concerned about as well. Finding materials for, for specific fields, right. Well, all of these things are um, definitely valid points and are in line with what we hear and see from faculty as well. Um, in fact, you may remember completing the course materials affordability um, survey that was sent out in the spring. That was actually what the first thing that the task force did um, when it was um, put together. So these are what respondents noted as um, the top challenges for transitioning to or using no or low cost course materials. So finding content at the top of the list, and that's what a few of you mentioned as well. Um, and it can be time consuming trying to spend, um, trying to find that content that is appropriate for the level and for the topic area. 
Broken links are also an issue, um, which to me means permanence. So um, a lot of these materials, uh, if they're not archived um, or curated properly, and they live on a web page, that, that sometimes um, those pages are disappear. And so it takes time to kind of ensure that all that information is, is still accessible each semester. Um, a few, just a, a couple notes about those two other bullet points, challenges getting materials from the library and also bookstore cooperation. Um, those are actually uh, issues that would be addressed by um, more use of lower or low or no cost course materials. Um, so for example, while our task force is really um, trying to get more faculty to use low or no cost course materials in the library, we do have some short-term strategies in place to connect students to their course materials. And Deanna already mentioned those course reserves and the textbook um, purchase recommendation form. But we are really limited by our budget and licensing issues as well. So it, it's not possible for us to purchase everything that everybody would want and provide access to that. So if um, more low or no cost materials were used, then you sort of get rid of the minute, minute the middleman. Um, Tracy mentioned quality. And so yes, definitely we're all concerned about making sure that we're finding quality, low and no cost course materials. Um, but actually studies have shown that generally no cost materials are considered as good as or better than traditional textbooks. Um, and students generally did better in classes using OERs versus traditional textbooks. Although that's, that second study um, only observed this, it didn't prove causation, so there could have been some other pedagogical strategies in place as well. Um, ultimately, though, while the impact on student learning is the same or better, the impact on breaking down barriers of affordability and accessibility um, are really significant. So if you wanted to use for your low cost materials in your courses, what do you think would be most important to you? So if you could kind of either throw that into the chat or kind of unmute yourself. I mean, what what is it that you're really looking for if you're going to be looking for free and low cost materials? And it may be the same things that you're looking for when you are um, using sort of traditional textbooks. Okay, yeah, definitely quality, yeah, quality, relevance, and being up to date. That's those are actually really really good points. Um, one of the things that's sort of interesting is that um, OER sometimes can be incredibly up to date because it doesn't have to go through the kind of traditional publishing model. Easy for students to access um, of equal quality to traditional course materials. Good visuals, yes. Um, multiple styles of learning. Yeah, matching with learning objectives. Yeah, these are all really great points and, and things that we should kind of keep in mind as we kind of move to, to the next part of, of, of the presentation. Um, one of the things that is interesting is in spring 2021, when the Course Materials Affordability um, Task Force surveyed faculty about their use of free and low cost materials, the majority of the 74 um, responses noted that they faced few or no challenges um, when making free or low cost materials available to students. Um, and so for those who did face challenges, they pointed to, say again, difficulties with finding content um, or finding the right material, the right reading level. Um, equally challenging, according to respondents, was the sense that finding um, affordable materials was time consuming. Um, but in a few minutes, we'll actually kind of do some searching and we'll kind of see whether this actually bears it out, whether it's a kind of um, a fear, but not necessarily a reality. Okay. One of the kind of main issues, um, though, as we go forward, is the question, are they any good? That quality issue um, is really a big deal for people. And we absolutely understand why it would be. Um, faculty are often concerned because commercials, kind of scholarly publishing has a long track record and inbuilt systems that are meant to ensure quality control. 
But even if a text is published by a publisher with a reputation for quality, it doesn't mean that everything they publish is high quality. And when we're talking about course materials, it never really is a one size fits all situation. Um, OERs um, absolutely can vary in quality, just like a commercially published book. Um, so it's really important for faculty to do their due diligence, just as you would when you're considering adopting any book. Next slide. Okay. And so there are some things that you can do um, as part of the process to, to really kind of vet materials and see if um, open educational resources are going to work for you. Um, and one of the things that's important to remember is that OERs have gone through a system of peer review, many of them have, with specialists reading, reviewing, and sharing those reviews so that prospective adopters can benefit from their expertise. And so peer reviewers are vocal about any deficiencies, um, but the majority of open textbook reviews are actually pretty positive. And so the good news about open publishing is that it's pretty easy to address any sort of reviewer concerns and fix any problems, um, something you would traditionally only be able to deal with in a new edition of a traditional textbook. And so that kind of question about making things, making sure our information is up to date. Um, with OER, you can make it up to date because when a new sort of um, a new sort of issue comes up, a new um, sort of um, paradigm comes up within a field, you can kind of address it and add it much more quickly than you can to traditional publishing. And so if you're going to be kind of going through this sort of process of trying to determine whether something is of good quality, it's useful to have a kind of checklist that you can sort of look at. And so um, we've kind of put this information here about sort of identifying and evaluating um, OER. And um, Larissa is putting a, a link to this in the chat. Um, and so you can look for those, those quality issues by saying, is there peer review av available and what does it look like? Um, looking up the, um, the author um, to say, you know, what's their reputation? What institution are they associated with? Um, looking to, at the kind of pedagogy to see if it seems sound, but also if it kind of fits with your own pedagogy. And then looking at things like appropriateness. Is the content accurate? Is it up to date? Does it align with course objectives and learning outcomes? Is it at the appropriate reading level for the course that you're in? So if you're in a graduate level, does it seem like it's on a kind of, you know, high, a slightly higher sort of discourse level than maybe for undergraduates? And then some of the technical aspects. Um, does it have um, clear visuals, high production value? Has it actually been copy, read, uh, copy edited and proofread? And by the way, um, I recently read a commercially produced textbook um, that kept misspelling the word university. Um, so, so it can happen anywhere at any time. Um, and then one of the other things you really want to pay attention to, is there some sort of clear licensing declaration? Okay. And so it's important to kind of evaluate things for yourself and these kind of criteria can help you. So one of the other things that kind of came up in that survey and this sort of come up in the chat too is, you know, how do you find materials? And um, we've tried to kind of um, make it a little bit easier for you. So one of the things that we've done is we've put together a LibGuide called the Finding and Accessing Content for Courses um, LibGuide, um, which Larissa has put into the chat. And so that can be incredibly useful. Um, you also can use Husky Search, so use our library um, to find library licensed materials. And many of you have already sort of done that as we kind of saw as, as kind of responses to the chat questions. Um, so you could find um, ebooks, journal articles, um, streaming video that we subscribe to. Um, one thing I really want to kind of draw your attention to, though, is be careful when, when you're talking about um, any sort of electronic content. Um, we get licenses um, for books and for streaming video, and some of these licenses are not for all time, and they are not all for unlimited users. Um, so for instance, um, some of you may have at one point um, asked the library to subscribe to a Canopy video. Um, those subscriptions last a single calendar year, and so we have to keep repurchasing it um, every year, and so it could lapse. It also sometimes, it has been available, but no longer is available. 
Um, the other issue is with ebooks. Um, we tend to think of, of ebooks as being this sort of automatically unlimited resource, um, but many of them have, uh, just like if you had a, a, a print book, um, one person can read it at a time, or sometimes three people could read it at a time. Um, some books do have licenses that we can purchase for unlimited um, readers. Um, they cost more, uh, but not every book has this. And so it's a really good idea to always ask before you assign. So if you're thinking about using um, some material in your courses, get in touch with your library subject specialist and have them look to see, you know, is this license going to end soon? Um, does it allow for unlimited users? If it doesn't, is it possible to switch our license so that it can be um, available to unlimited users. Um, also, another kind of note, occasionally we will buy an ebook and we have an unlimited license, but the ebook publisher will decide that they want to change its status and now call it from it had been just a regular book and now they're going to call it a textbook. If that happens, we actually lose our license and would have to repurchase it. So anything that you're thinking about using that's a not a print item, um, it's probably a good idea to get in touch with your subject specialist. Okay. Um, the other thing to kind of um, think about when you're when you're looking at, at low cost materials, a lot of people use Google, um, and Google is perfectly fine. Um, and it, the only issue is potentially some of those issues with broken links and permanence. Um, there are also sometimes issues with um, copyright. Um, and so again, it's probably a good idea to sort of check on some of these materials. But if you're using, say, a YouTube video in your class, in your Blackboard shell, usually that is something that's going to be covered by fair use. And so you should be good to go. OK, I'm going to actually share my screen so that I can um, give you, show you just a little bit um, of the resources that Deanna had mentioned. Um, so this is the library's website. And if we scroll to the middle section here, um, Husky Search, Deanna had mentioned that this is our discovery tool for the library. It's the first tab listed. And you can actually uh, limit your search to um, ebooks specifically or articles and more. So this would include um, articles, um, book chapters, conference proceedings in some cases, all, all of the things that would be um, searchable in articles and more uh, would be is available electronically. So ebooks and articles are more good places to go um, for library materials. And of course, you can go to um, specific library databases under resources by subject to find the, the specialized data play, databases in your discipline. Um, the subject guide that we sent a link for that Deanna mentioned, you can access it through our scrolling banner here. Um, under help faculty, helping faculty help students, you can just click on the banner and access it. Um, we change the banner around sometimes though, so I also wanted to show that you can go to services and then scroll down to textbook affordability and then that link will take you to the finding and accessing content for courses, free, open, and affordable resources. So this is the subject guide that Deanna had mentioned. Um, and on this home page for the, the guide, there is information about the textbook purchase program and a link to the recommendation form. So this is always there if you're looking for it. Um, and again, we can do that for fall and spring semesters. But the place that you'll probably want to spend the most time is on the Find No Low Cost Course Materials page under this tab. Um, and this is where we've curated a bunch of resources to find open um, or low cost course materials. So the first sub tab here is for open textbooks. Um, there's uh, other types of, of ebooks. We have um, resources listed for videos, for images and music and courses. Um, and also this is a handy sub tab as well. These are um, federated searches so that you can um, search multiple OER resources at once. Uh, I, I particularly like OASIS and OER Commons. I think those are useful, so you can explore those. Um, the other page I wanted to mention on this um, subject guide is the subject-specific resources. 
Um, this is um, continues to be a work in progress. Subject specialist librarians are um, identifying open textbooks that they find and then including them um, here under the different disciplines. So there's a bunch of art history textbooks. There's some um, business education. Um, and again, right now it's it's the list isn't too, too long, but we are constantly updating it. And if you know of any, then you can always send that to us and we can um, include it on our list here. And I see that someone had a question. Was that Steve? Steve, if you'd like to go ahead and um, unmute or or, or uh, drop your question in the chat. Oh, sorry. OK, no problem. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna, um, what we'd like now is to, I'm gonna share my, continue to share my screen. We'd like to give you some time to um, actually explore some resources. So I've created, I'm gonna drop this in the chat here, the link to this chart. So um, I believe I've assigned everybody um, a resource on this chart. And let me know if you can't access it, because I always seem to have issues <laughs> like, like giving everybody access to these. Um, if you would like to, uh, the link is also listed here. So you can right click and open the link to the resource. You can select, choose a subject to search. And my recommendation is, um, when you're trying to find library resources, you can be really specific about the actual, the you know, the topic that you are looking for. Um, but when it comes to these OER resources, they are not as extensive as maybe our library resources are. So I, I tend to recommend searching for the larger subject area or discipline first, and then try to um, narrow it down because you might be able to find you know, the specific topics or subjects within um, like a textbook, an open textbook. But if you do, if you start out with that very specific search, you're not going to come up with um, a lot. So, um, so if you could, if you can explore your resource, we'll give you about um, eight to 10 minutes and uh, see how many results you get. Uh, how many of them do you think are textbooks? And then if you could choose one of the sources that you find and then just take a closer look to see if there's any licensing of information available, any additional um, ancillaries, are there reviews? So um, right now we'd just like you to um, explore some of these resources and then we'll get back and hopefully uh, you'll share and, and we can have a bit of a discussion. So I'm gonna set the timer for about eight minutes and we'll see where we are.
All right, how about two more minutes? All right, last 30 seconds, if you just want to finish up, add any last comments or observations. Okay, time's up. Thanks, everyone. Looks like looks like the chart's pretty well filled in. So we'd love right now if um, someone would be willing to sort of volunteer and talk a little bit about the process, how it was for you. Um, did you find something that you feel like might actually work for for one of your courses? Um, so it, we, it would be great if you're um, willing to unmute and talk or throw something in the into the chat. Either way. So oh, Erin, would you like to share? Yeah, um, I thought this was uh, really a, a great exercise. I was um, really kind of pleasantly surprised at how much I was able to find. Um, obviously not a lot of kind of like more niche texts, but um, quite a few that seemed like they would be really solid for like general ecology courses. And that was really encouraging. And I liked that uh, on the source I was looking through, there was um, space for there to be um, ancillary information and uh, there were whole like course resources uh, available in addition to textbooks through Oasis, which was super cool. That's great. Um, yeah, one of the things that, that's sort of interesting is when you kind of go back and, and look at some of these things, additional materials sometimes show up because because they are sort of, um, you know, open educational resources, someone will kind of riff off of that original material and kind of create create additional materials. And so um, that's one of the things that's sort of that's really interesting about the process is you, you may go in today and there are two texts and there may be 12 texts a year from now. Um, and so that's sort of interesting. And, and it's nice that, you know, as you say, maybe there it wasn't really niche, um, but there may be some materials that you could use. Um, and so it seemed relatively easy for you, Erin, and for everyone else to kind of get in there and, and do some pretty basic searching. Yeah, I think it was all really straightforward through my resource, at least. Great. Anybody else want to share anything about the process or what you found or things that you were hoping to find that you didn't? One of the things that I'm noticing just kind of going down the page is how many of these actually do have reviews, um, which is great. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that's really useful is if you go in and start kind of playing around with this and, and kind of um, give some feedback on what's here and what's not there is that, that often the authors of these um, these texts do actually take that um, that information on board and do make those changes in the next edition that comes out. OK. 
Okay, so no specific textbook for your course, but some books that might be used for other courses in the program. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is because this is still a relatively new field. Um, you unfortunately you're not going to find um, always exactly what you want um, for every course, but sometimes there are there are bits and pieces that are usable within individual texts. Um, and as you say, sometimes you know maybe not for your particular course, but another um, you know course in your discipline. Great, thank you so much for for taking the time to do this. Hopefully, one of the things that kind of you came away with is this is sort of less onerous than it initially seems, um, you know, that we spent 10 minutes and that you can actually, you know, get in there, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and one of the things that's sort of interesting is, you know, you may find in, in one of these particular resources, you didn't find loads of materials, but going into one of the other ones, you may find tons. Um, and so, it, you know, sort of trying around just sort of playing um, in, in these, you know, it's sort of like Googling where, you know, the, the first things you come across, you know, you may find, find some great stuff, but the great stuff really may be on page 15. Um, you know, if you spend a little bit more time, you can often find um, exactly what you want, depending on what your field is. Um, and so it, it kind of, at least you kind of get in there and see that it's it's not as intimidating as it as it initially seems. So we, we really appreciate you kind of taking the time to, to go through this. And um, you can sort of use the, the you know, this, um, um, this kind of information sheet, you know, for yourself, even when you're kind of going and thinking about, um, you know, researching materials for, you know, for a future course. Um, so it's something to think about. So one of the things we, we really wanted to talk about um, as a kind of follow up to this is where you kind of go from here. Um, and so, you know, what are some potential next steps? And so obviously one of the things we would love is for you to potentially go and look at the, um, the LibGuide that we put together, look at some of the resources, go to the subject um, specific areas if, there, if we have some available for you and kind of see what's there. Um, look through these, these various repositories, um, look to see um, you know, how you can um, you know, potentially start making a move toward um, free or low cost. Um, We'd also, you know, love to kind of hear what you'd like to do. I mean, one of the possibilities is to kind of say, I'm interested in this, but I want um, to really talk with somebody who's a little bit more familiar with working with these resources. And so you could talk to your subject specialist librarian. Um, if you're really interested, um, you could also think about joining the Course Materials Affordability Task Force. Um, we're always happy to get uh, faculty perspectives um, because, you know, as librarians, we certainly you know, see things in a, in a very specific way, as do um, the folks at um, CIDL. But, you know, if you're in the trenches, if you're sort of working um, with students and trying to kind of relay um, content, um, you may have a, a very sort of different insight on, on matters that we haven't considered and we would love to see those. Um, and so what we kind of really want to kind of do at the very last thing is to sort of say, you know, what is one thing that you plan to do after this session to implement what you've learned today? Um, and it can be a very small thing um, or it could, you know, be something large like, you know, committing to switching over all your classes. Um, but again, we, we're not sort of um, asking you to, to change the world today. Um, but is there something that, that you think you can, you can do after sort of um, today's session based on what you've learned today? We'd love for you to either unmute and share or um, put something in the chat. And you'll see that Larissa has put in the various links there for the task force, for the subject specialist directory, and for the guide. One really simple thing is to do just a little bit more of what we were doing here as part of the, the demo of just sort of looking in some of these repositories and seeing what's out there. Okay, so taking advantage of the resources provided today, look for textbooks. Okay, 
locating resources to use in future courses and working to contribute to resources by sharing lessons excellent on, on course source. That's a really great thing. Okay, so investing more time in finding low uh, and no cost materials. Excellent, adopting at least two no or low cost materials by next fall, that is amazing. All of these are incredibly good ideas. Um, and yeah, absolutely excellent goals. And, and so we're, we're, you know, we're really wanting to sort of partner with, with faculty to, to make a difference. Um, you can also, you know, request a textbook from, um, from the textbook pilot program. Um, you know, try and sort of use a book and put it on reserve, or if we can get an, an ebook with unlimited users, that's great too. And so um, the idea really is to try and make even a, a really kind of minor change that can make a really major change um, in the, the academic life of, of students. Um, you know, we all want students to succeed and sort of looking at the, the course materials affordability issue is one way to help do that. So are there any questions? Um, are there sort of concerns? Anything that you'd like us to, to, to talk a little bit more about? Any kind of additional barriers that you see to, to kind of moving in this direction? Absolutely, we'll be happy to share the link. Yes, and we'll 